I regret that he left the world so early or that so much time has lapsed between the time that he left the world and today because we have so few people around who actually knew him and, and could speak to uh, you know, some very personal uh, piece, you know, pieces about him. I think, first of all, people don't realize what a pioneer he was. Uh, he was among the first of the group of actors and actresses, mostly actors at the time, that began the Hollywood film industry. Uh, this was back in probably the late teens. I think his first film was 1917. And uh, he was in something like 75 silent films over about a 12-year period. Um, the, the talkies, as they call them, didn't come in until 1928. So he had at least a decade of, of films that he made. I think community is something that tends to be very strong in an immigrant uh, situation because when you leave your home, you become very conscious of what your home base is. So I think that's part of it. I also think that being an actor um, and being a, what is primarily known as a character actor, somebody who was capable of playing many different types of roles from a complete uh, hero all the way down to, uh, you know, the most villainous villain, um, I think that offers uh, an insight into the human condition and the human situation that, um, because no actor really plays a villain as if they're horrible. Uh, a good actor plays a villain as if they're just misunderstood or, or that they're really just somebody who, who took a different path. So the Motion Picture and Television Fund is now in its 97th year, and it's a uh, charity that was organized in 1921 by industry visionaries Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, D.W. Griffith, and Douglas Fairbanks with the notion that uh, the principal uh, organization of labor in the entertainment industry is freelance, and freelance workers by their very nature have ups and downs in their careers, and the four of them felt like they needed to create a charity that would be there to support those workers uh, when they were in hard, in hard times. So it's actually at that time called the Motion Picture Relief Fund, and it was specifically financial charitable assistance. We actually have the case management cards uh, from that period, 1921, and they're literally buying Harry a suit for his next audition, buying Mary a wig, um, finding uh, a, an apartment for someone and paying rent for a few months and helping find that person a job. So it was very small, very specific. Uh, it was about money and employment. And it really stayed that way for a long period of time, uh, really until Gene Herschel comes along. So Gene really comes at a seminal uh, uh, inflection point in the uh, Motion Picture Relief Fund. The, the kind of momentum built by the founders uh, is starting to wane in the early to mid-30s as, as their careers are as well to some degree. Um, and along comes this uh, Danish immigrant uh, by the name of Gene Hersholt, uh, who clearly has you know, I don't know whether it's his Danish roots or the fact that he's an immigrant who, you know, has become a success in this industry, has, you know, a uh, sense and sensibility for this organization. Uh, and he really becomes the engine for growth for the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, I, the, the story is that he went out to Woodland Hills 
um, which was basically orange groves back in the 1940s, and uh, led the industry in coming up with the funds to buy that piece of property. This new hospital is not the end of our dreams. There are others yet to be realized. But we have what it takes. We have both heart and muscle. It ha I have the feeling that all our dreams will come true. The first thing that he uh, did was identify that a, there was a need to build a retirement community for members of the industry. So it, it'll sound silly because the industry is only you know 15 or 20 years old at that point, but he realized that a lot of these uh, workers who lived uh, week paycheck to paycheck really had nowhere to retire and had this idea that wouldn't it be incredible to build this community where they could retire in place with other members of the community. So he had this vision, the fund didn't have the money to do it, uh, so he creates something called Screen Guild Theater. And Screen Guild Theater was on CBS radio, hence this photo, uh, and, on, and supported by Gulf Oil. Um, and every week there was, I think, a one-hour radio show uh, featuring uh, readings of plays, of fi famous film scripts, uh, just kind of people kibitzing. Uh, all of the people donated their time, and these are famous actors and actresses of the period. Uh, and the money for that went into a pot that Gene was keeping to one day uh, find a campus, some land somewhere to build this community. Uh, it has been this, you know, the spine of workers in the industry for 97 years. I mean, we probably have helped hundreds of thousands of industry workers, uh, you know, from every from below the line, above the line, you know, any any place on the call sheet, uh, we've helped uh, someone, and some of them have been quite famous. Um, Daniel Selznick, who lives on the campus today, who's the grandson of Louis B. Mayer, and the son of da David O. Selznick, uh, recollects coming to the campus with his grandfather to visit Norma Shearer from Sunset Boulevard. Uh, so, you know, that's the kind of person we had on this campus, uh, lots of other famous stars, and then a lot of, uh, you know, people who, you know, were, uh, worked on, uh, were greensmen or gaffers or grips or secretaries at studios. So it's really been the whole uh, breadth of the industry, but it has you know literally kept people out of bankruptcy, keep, kept people in good health, kept them in good financial health, come to the aid of people when they have couldn't pay their mortgage, couldn't pay their rent, couldn't make their car payments, couldn't go to work because they had a loved one at home uh, who needed a caregiver. to be at that, at that time that anybody in a studio could vote and so the biggest studio with the most employees tended to win um, but uh, the gene changed it so that in order to vote you had to be a member of the Academy and it became much more democratic in the way things were chosen he also expanded the number of branches that the Academy had adding cinematography and production is our they called it art direction at that time uh, and I think uh, to sound and editing, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they had not had specific branches before. They all used to be just considered scientific and technical. And so he created a much more dip, uh, democratic uh, sense of balance on who participated, where editors and cinematographers had the same voice as producers and actors, uh, so to speak. And that's carried over into the Academy even today. So in essence, it was during Gene uh, Hirschholz's presidency that the modern academy was formed uh, in the way we know it today. 
He was the one who was very much a proponent of educational programs. He's the reason I'm sitting here today talking to you about my job. The Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award was um, something that was uh, created after his death. He had received a Special Academy Award for his work, uh, his personal work, as Academy President, but also as the President for, I think, 18 years or so of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, which created the Motion Picture Country uh, House and, and uh, its clinics um, in Woodland Hills. Um, and so his deep uh, involvement in those uh, very industry-oriented uh, things you know, the Motion Picture Country uh, House has a creed, uh, you know, we take care of our own. And that was very much something that the Academy wanted to acknowledge uh, with their award to Jean in, uh, I believe, 1949, if I'm not mistaken. And then later in his death, they cre after his death, they created the Jean Herschel Humanitarian Award. And I've read the minutes to the meetings, and, and they were clearly looking for the right thing to do, and there were several proposals that came forward, but it really became obvious to, to uh, the board that creating this Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award was a way to make sure that the Academy kept that legacy of above and beyond what's the best movie or who's the best actor or any of that kind of stuff, um, and including the philanthropic and humanitarian nature of the business. Um, which often gets forgotten, um, but in almost any crisis or disaster, the first people called upon to help are, you know, celebrities and, and actors and, and uh, people with influence in uh, the communication industries. And that's, that's been traditional, and it continues today. And I think that uh, when they created that award, they didn't say that it had to be given every year. They said, as needed, as, as uh, warranted. And so uh, over the, since 1957, it's been awarded, I believe, 38 times. So that's not even close to every year. Um, and the types of people and the types of uh, philanthropies that they've been involved in are very uh, numerous. Uh, it's not all motion picture related. It's not all um, you know, hospitals and things. I mean, it's all different kinds of things. And so I think it's a way to not only, uh, you know, realize that there's more to life than movies, uh, but also realize there's more to the movies than just the business. Mm -hmm.